Smith Show. For more information, go to thericksmithshow.com. If you've missed any portion of the program, you can download the podcast at thericksmithshow.com. You're listening to Win Workers Independent News, a Diversified Media Enterprises production. I'm Doug Cunningham. The NFL Players Association says that NFL players are union members and part of the labor movement that has woven the fabric of America for generations. The Players Union says some players have decided to use their platform to peacefully raise awareness to issues that deserve attention. The NFL Players Association says we should not stifle these discussions and cannot allow our rights to become subservient to the very opinions our Constitution protects. Meanwhile, WBAP 820 AM in Fort Worth, Texas, says that Local 100 of United Labor Unions is filing NLRB charges against Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones over the NFL player protests. That union says NFL players have the right of concerted action to protest under the National Labor Relations Act. The complaint says Jones's efforts now to force players not to protest during the national anthem violates the players' rights to concerted action under the NLRB. A planned strike by hundreds of part-time faculty at Tufts University got canceled Wednesday when a tentative new labor agreement was reached. SEIU Local 509 says the five-year tentative deal improves wages and teaching conditions for the part-time faculty. Part-time faculty at Tufts voted to unionize in 2014. More than half of the part-time faculty will see pay raises of 22.5% over the five-year agreement. Others will get a minimum of 12.5% pay hikes. Finding themselves constrained by a legal challenge to their efforts to form a union at the University of Minnesota, faculty there are moving away from the traditional NLRB union election model and to a workers' association instead. Anna Kurhajic is a lecturer in American Studies at the University of Minnesota. We wanted to start doing things that actually could, you know, get us some wins and build some organizing around issues, find opportunities to build solidarity with other workers and students on campus. So we talked about moving away from the traditional unionization model and going towards the workers' association, which for us opens up a lot of possibilities. We're really, really excited about it. Kurhajic says the legal challenge would have divided faculty along class lines lines between tenure and non-tenure contingent faculty. That class difference was unacceptable to pro-union faculty. Across the board at all of our meetings, tenure-track faculty refused to be classed differently than our colleagues who have contingent appointments. A really important step of solidarity for us. University of Minnesota faculty are hoping that their workers association enables solidarity and more powerful organizing with many other workers beyond the faculty. Win is America's multimedia news voice for workers. We need to make more money. You know, what they're paying us, the greedy corporation, they just want to pay us what they want to pay us. And it's not right. Support WIN's Worker News Mission at WorkersIndependentNews.com. You've been listening to WIN, Workers Independent News. For more information, visit WorkersIndependentNews.com. It's time for the Rick Smith Show. I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell... I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. I don't want to abolish government. I simply want to reduce it to the size where I could drag it into the bathroom and drown in the bathtub. You better cut the taxes at the top. How dare you? How dare you? Go ahead. Make my day. The Rick Smith Show starts now. Now. Welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to. Lots to talk about. The Donald in Harrisburg. Uh, the truckers. He loves the truckers. And I got to be. I got a question right from the start. 
He had a big, beautiful truck, big 53-foot trailer, big sleeper cab, all decked out with, well, we're going to make America great. We're going to you know, raise wages. We're going to do all of these things. And I, you know, I looked at this and I said, you know, that's like 25 grand to wrap a, a semi. You know, who paid for that? Was that our tax dollars? You know, was that money that should have gone to, I don't know, education, infrastructure, Puerto Rico? You know, just kind of a thought. And yet, well, quite an interesting, quite an interesting event it was indeed yesterday. And and look, uh, I look at the and I watched the speech. I watched uh, Hannity, that little weasel. I got to be honest, as Trump was talking about how much he loves truckers and there, you know, nothing gets done in America without the hardworking men and women in the trucking industry. And, uh, you know, no one knows America better than America's truck drivers. And, you know, I just, you know, it's one of those things where you, you look at somebody and you go, wow, that, that guy's really a used car salesman. Pander much. And then he even went further and said, you know, to the handful of truckers that were there. You are our heroes. Believe me, you are our hero. Heroes? Really? Do you have any idea? Do you have any freaking idea what happens in the trucking industry? Do you have any idea the exploitation, the poverty? Do you have any clue of what deregulation has done to a once proud, once solidly middle class industry? Do you have any, is there, is there anything banging around between those orange ears? I mean, honestly, truthfully, anything? Because to say that these truck drivers are our heroes? Wow. I mean, honestly, wow. Because, look, this is one of those things that's just, you know, mind-blowing to me. Over the last 40 years, what you've seen in the, in the trucking industry especially, and most people don't know this, you know, back in the 80s when I started, you know, 1980, I'm, 1988, I'm making 15 bucks an hour throwing boxes on a shipping dock. I'm uh, health care, pension, paid days off. You know, more than 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, today, the exact same job. Pays 14 bucks an hour, no health care, no pension. You know, I, I was telling my daughter just the other day, you know, 30 years ago, I was making more money doing the work that I do. 30 years ago, we have seen not just a stagnation in wages in the trucking industry and across all industries as the Republicans, as the wealth class, as the corporate class, however you want to categorize them, as they have pursued this anti-union, anti-worker agenda while simultaneously doing things like Trump did yesterday here in Harrisburg, which was pander, 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 promise the sun, the moon. It's going to be great. You're going to be able to eat cake every day, every meal, and you don't have to worry about gaining weight or getting diabetes. It's going to be great. It's going to be fabulous, and it'll be free, and it'll always be your favorite cake. It'll never be any of that crummy stuff. The, the, the spice nut or the, you know, the pumpkin or none of that. It's going to be the good stuff always. Because, you know, he went into this rant about how we want lower taxes and bigger paychecks and more jobs. And who doesn't want that? Yet you drill down into the what few details and what few bits of information we have. And we know that, you know, this promise that that Trump made that the average family is going to get $4,000 a year. Good. Really? The average family is going to get four grand more a year. Who could possibly be against that? But then you kind of drill down into the details and you realize, uh Oh, um, that's not reality. In fact, some of the studies that I've seen already are based on what, what we know, what limited information we know is probably the average working class person going to get about 60, 70 bucks. And you go, well, where's the 
Because guess what? Uh, living in a sweatshop on wheels is expensive. And he said, look, you know, it, it's almost not worth it. But being from Alabama, where he was from, there are no other jobs. So he's out seeing the country, and he loves the job. He loves seeing the country, loves, loves you know, being all over the country, but working at poverty wages. And to have Trump pander in front of, of so-called a bunch of truck drivers, and they weren't. Look, in order to get tickets to that event, you had to be a Republican loyalist. You basically had to swear a blood oath that you were a Trump supporter. Uh, we tried to get tickets from, from different sources. wasn't happening. This isn't one of those events where you could go online and sign up and, and they'll, get, they'll email you a ticket. No, no. You had to actually know somebody to get into that room. You had to kiss a ring. You had to bow down. You had to genuflect to power and, and, and say, my undying allegiance to the orange menace. And the thing that bothers me, and again, you know, I go back to this to the to the crowd. You saw the this crowd of people there. And understand, and maybe it's maybe it's me, but I find it really difficult and I'm really struck by the fact that there was a crowd of so-called truckers who were applauding the end to the estate tax. There isn't a truck driver in this country with the exception of maybe one that, you know, Won the birth lottery and just decided, hey, I'm going to learn to drive. But I would, I would be willing to bet there isn't one truck driver in this country that the estate tax would affect. Not one. We're talking, you know, what was it, five million dollars uh, before the estate tax kicks in for a couple. And I also find it very difficult for a crowd of truck drivers to be applauding a 25% top marginal tax rate. Uh, there isn't a working truck driver in this country, and I don't really care what you do, but there isn't a working truck driver in this country that makes over a million and a half dollars a year. No matter what the fantasy, no matter the pandering, no matter what Trump says or claims he believes, sorry, not going to happen. So I find it really difficult that, you know, how this this propaganda, all this stuff, it's, it's, it's crazy to me. And as I was watching Trump's speech and as I was listening to, you know, the, the back and forth with him and the, the little weasel, you know, I just, you know, I was just struck by, you know, if you want better wages, you want bigger paychecks, you want health insurance, join a union, man. You know, as we said the other day, you know, 94% of union members have access to health care on the job. 94%. And you go, well, it's got to be fairly close to that in the, in the, in the non-union sector, right? Well, the non-union people, about 34% have access to employer-based health care. There's a, a real small difference there. And I would argue most of those truck drivers there are getting crushed by health care costs. But what he's doing, not going to make it better. Uh, not going to make it better. And look, he's he's a master at pandering. I give him credit, man. He is the ultimate used car salesman. He, you know, I don't know that there's anything, maybe a radio salesman. Maybe that's below a used car salesman. I don't know. But if there's something below a a used car salesman, that's probably where, where Trump is. He is that kind of sleazy in my view. Uh, that kind of pandering, that kind of aggrandizing, you know, it's its really quite remarkable. But I kept coming back to a, a very simple question. And that very simple question is always, when does a politician, when does a part of the wealth class, when do they ever, when do they ever think or care about the working person when it comes to policy? Every tax break that's ever happened in my lifetime has gone to the very wealthy. And what we've done, it's because it's under this guise of if we give them all the money, they're smart, they'll know what to do with it, and then it, it should trickle down to the rest of us. Something should fall out of their pocket. Uh, we should get some alternative help out of this. And it never happens. Uh, we never benefit from it. We'll get a scrap or a crumb over here. But the mass of the pie, the mass of the, the cut, goes to the Trumps and, and his ilk and his country club buddies. This is going to be no different 
no matter what he says. To me, it's that simple. Love to hear your thoughts. You can email me, rick at therigsmithshow.com. Going to take a quick break. When we come back, are we on the precipice of war? Are we, are we redoing, well, Iraq? Are we, well, are we being, are we being sleepwalked into the next into the next world war? Craig Harrington is going to be here to tell us what, what fake news is doing. Quick break. Right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Let's talk. There's a flaw in the system And the fly in the oil And the storm bring the whole thing down The gates are open We've let the demons loose The big guns have spoken And we fall and fall the roots I'm Rick Smith and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1845. That was the day that the first Industrial Congress of the United States met in New York City. People interested in the problems facing working people, including long hours, low pay, and unsafe working conditions, gathered together. The labor movement was just beginning in this country. These were the years when the early trade unions were formed. Women played an important role in the early labor movement. Female textile mill workers in Lawrence, Massachusetts, began to organize for the 10-hour day. In 1844, they established the Lowell Female Labor Reform Association. Their goal was to improve working conditions in the mills. The Lowell Women's Group sent a representative to New York for the Labor Congress. Another important development of the fledgling labor movement was the establishment of labor presses. George Henry Evans, a labor newsman, also attended the Congress. He was the editor of a series of U.S. labor papers, starting with the Workmen's Advocate in 1829. He had come to the United States from England, where he had been involved in the trade labor movement. He also attended the Labor Congress. The meeting recommended the formation of three organizations. First was an industrial brotherhood for workers, including farmers. The second was an industrial sisterhood for women workers. The third was a group for friends of labor. The Congress met again in New York in 1847, then again met in Chicago in 1850. These early efforts to establish larger labor groups did not gain much traction, but they began to lay the framework for workers to come together to discuss their challenges and imagine how they could work together to bring about change for better wages, shorter hours, and safer working conditions. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Check out the website, therigsmithshow.com. Questions, comments, something on your mind. You can email me, Rick, at therigsmithshow.com. So is it is it deja vu all over again? Are we simply, uh, is the messaging that coming out of Fox News the same kind of drumbeat that we saw in the run-up to Iraq? Uh, i got to be honest. I'm, I'm literally freaked out when I hear our president say, you know, hey, this could be the calm before the storm, and there's only one way to deal with uh, with North Korea, uh, I got to be honest. It, it's it's troubling. It's concerning. It's all of that. And here to talk about it, I've asked Craig Harrington. He's the associate research director over at Media Matters for America. Craig, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks for having me again. So, am I getting this right? I mean, you know, I'm watching Fox News. I'm seeing a lot of the same kinds of, you know, that kind of fear, that kind of drumbeat. Am I getting this right? Yeah, and actually, if you've been watching Fox News at all this morning, uh, they've done a lot of sort of scaremongering and fear tactics about uh, Iranian military capabilities and Iranian ties to uh, terror organizations and the supposed threat that those organizations um, uh, present to the United States. They've spent a lot of time on that this morning. Um, But the reason that we're talking is because yesterday um, Fox News did something that was literally just taken directly out of the Iraq War playbook, which is that they – spent a significant amount of their news um, their news apparatus, uh, invested a significant amount of time and editorial resources into promoting a report from an exile government um, uh, or a, an organization that considers itself an exile government of Iran, um, which claimed that Iran was in violation of its um, 
nuclear proliferation commitments and its um, its commitments and compliance standards with the Iran nuclear deal brokered in 2015. Uh, yesterday, Fox and Friends um, promoted this segment all morning long, and then on October 10th, they actually had an exclusive report on FoxNews.com from an organization that calls itself the National Council of Resistance of Iran, which claimed that Iran was in violation of its nuclear commitments. And if, of course, Iran is in violation of the nuclear commitments, then the Iran deal falls apart, then diplomacy falls apart. And even Democrats in 2015 were saying that the only way to guarantee that Iran never achieved a nuclear weapon without um, a military intervention was this kind of diplomatic dialogue. And if that diplomatic dialogue fails, then you fall back to the baseline option of military intervention in Iran. The problem with this is that the National Council of Resistance of Iran um, fills the same role that the Iraqi National Congress filled in 2002 and 2003, which is it's a government uh, or it's an organization that considers itself a government in exile. It's made up of er exiled Iranians. Uh, the INC, of course, was made up of exiled Iraqis. And if they can convince the United States government to intervene against the legitimate government in Tehran, as it did against the government in Baghdad in 2003, every member of that organization stands to benefit enormously, um, potentially taking over whatever government is constructed in the wake, in the vacuum of a military conflict between the United States and Iran if we did topple the government in Tehran the way we toppled the government in Baghdad. This is exactly what happened in the lead up to the Iraq war. And Fox News is now basically dusting off the playbook that it used during the drumbeat of the Iraq War um, and now applying that directly to Iran. Um, luckily, Trump hasn't been able to get himself undistracted from the chaos in his own administration uh, and his inability to deal with the crisis in Puerto Rico and his hatred of black athletes in the NFL. Um, so he hasn't really been focused on Iran yet. Uh, but there's plenty of time, and he's widely expected to decertify the Iran deal any time between Friday and um, Sunday when the deadline actually will lapse uh, about whether or not we can recertify that agreement. So we're, best, we're definitely standing on the edge of a precipice, and Fox News is definitely employing the same tactics that it used in 2001, 2002, and 2003 to push us over that edge. Yeah, I mean, I look at this, and again, you – uh, the, the drum beat out of the White House has been, we're going to pull out of that deal. And I've been asking the question, what happens then? I mean, I have a friend who's a, a military expert who said, if you think Iraq was fun, if you think Iraq was, was dangerous, if you think Iraq was, was bad, wait till you, wait till you start fiddling around with Iran. Uh, because they actually have a functional military and a functional uh, air force. And that these diplomatic ties, that the ability to do these inspections is the only real sane way to go forward but i gotta be honest i, I have very little faith uh in donald trump to to be honest i have very little faith yeah and um you know the point you made you, you, if you talk to military people about you know iraq versus iran first of all the foremost uh conclusion you could take away is that the united states would win any conventional war against any military anywhere in the world right so could we could we defeat iran yes but it, everyone remembers um how devastating the Iraq War was, how it became this eight-year quagmire that cost thousands of American lives, tens of thousands of American injuries, hundreds of thousands of Iraqi dead civilians and military members. Um, and Iran has so much more going for it in 2017 than Iraq did in 2003. First and foremost, it's almost four times the size of Iraq in terms of its land area, um, and its population is more than twice the size of Iraq. Add to that the fact that in 2003, we attacked Iraq uh, 12 years after having, devastating its, having already devastated its military just 12 years before and after having put in place grinding economic and diplomatic and military sanctions that had been in place for 12 years, yep. which essentially hollowed out its command and control structure and completely weakened and decimated its military. Iran faces none of those problems. And it's important to point out that when we first attacked Iraq in the early 1990s, Iraq was just emerging from an eight-year war with Iran, right. which devastated both countries. All of our attacks against Iraq have been attacks that were launched against an enemy that was in a completely weakened state. That's not the case with Iran. It's bigger, it's wealthier, it's more powerful, its military is better equipped, its economy is more robust. Um, 
the terrain is much more difficult for the United States military to operate in. And ever since they stormed our embassy in 1979, the Iranian government has been preparing itself for a U.S. ground invasion. And that is particularly the case since 2002 and 2003 when we put hundreds of thousands of troops on their border in Iraq and Afghanistan. Iran is prepared for a U.S. military invasion. They are prepared for it. It will be much worse than the Iraq war. And that's the thing that people don't really understand. You don't have to be a member of the United States military to look at a map and realize that um, any confrontation with Iran is going to be terrible for the United States, even if technically by the strategy, by the tactics, and by the measurements, uh, we would win the fight. Well, here's the question. I keep coming back to this. You know, with Iraq, I don't, I don't know what winning looks like. We still haven't defined what winning is there or in Afghanistan. What would winning look like in Iran? Or are we just dropping bombs for the sake of, hey, it's 5 o'clock, let's drop some bombs? Well, you know, uh, I've recently been binge-watching uh, Ken Burns' incredible documentary series on the Vietnam War, and despite some legitimate criticisms of the way it portrays the fighting and the reasons that the United States were there, one of the overarching themes that you get um, after a couple of hours um, of reviewing the, the documentary footage is that the United States' approach to Vietnam War was purely about numbers. You know, we didn't know who we were fighting. We didn't know why we were fighting. We didn't support the government that we were supporting. We didn't actually like the incredibly corrupt South, South Vietnamese officials who we were defending against communism. But what we did know is that we could kill more North Vietnamese and more Viet Cong soldiers than they could kill American and South Vietnamese soldiers. And we knew that we had uh, better equipment and that we had better delivery systems, that we could drop more bombs, that we could fire more artillery shells, that we could send in more tanks, um, and that we could kill more of them than they could kill of us. Uh, and that basically is the same proposition that was applied to Iraq. We had no idea why we were there. We had no reason to support the government that we were supporting. But technically, uh, our soldiers were out-battling their soldiers uh, and out-battling the insurgents uh, after the military crumbled and dissipated into the communities, into the surrounding communities. Um, if that's what the best case scenario is for Iran, you know, we've seen this movie before. We did this in Vietnam. We did this in Iraq. We're still doing it today in Afghanistan. Um, there's no reason to think that there's some magic bullet where we can, um, where we can go in and, and do things better this time. Uh, but there is a lot of reason to believe uh, that things will turn out very badly for us if we do decide to just abandon diplomacy uh, and go back to this sort of bellicose interventionism, which Donald Trump seems to prefer. Yeah, I mean, if, if body count is the, uh, is, the t is the way we define victory, then, yeah, I'm sure we'll kill more of them. Uh, but at what cost to us, at what cost to us in, in blood and, and also in, in treasure and opportunity for future generations? I mean, it just all of this to me seems like we're heading down the, the absolute worst possible path only because we've got a guy who's incapable of of being somewhat diplomatic. Because, you know, I've got friends who who uh, who who go to Iran quite often and, uh, you know, they come back and say, look, there's a large portion of the Iranian population who doesn't like their leadership. They want to be more westernized. They want an economy you know, like ours. They they want a lot of they they want a lot of what we have. But, you know, it keeps coming back to this kind of stuff, this kind of chest thumping and these kind of threats is what gives the hardliners, uh, you know, the ammunition to attack them. And I think that's one of the things that's particularly pervasive and pernicious about the way conservative media, the apologists and the defenders of Trump, uh, the way that they're approaching Iran, the way that they're approaching North Korea, is no one is really pointing out the fact that they're, um, at, the, at, the, uh, at the end of the day, on the other end of the spectrum, are millions of people. Um, who have thoughts and feelings and emotions and preferences and who can be negotiated with because they're, they have the same end goals that any American would have. Um, the Iranian people are, are just people at the end of the day. Uh, but when they're discussed on Fox News, uh, when they are discussed, unfortunately, in the halls of power in the White House, uh, you're just talking about an organization that seems like a big monolithic enemy. Uh, and that's exactly how the media were portraying um, Iraq in the lead up to the disastrous Iraq war in 2002 and 2003. Uh, luckily, so far, your CNNs and your MSNBCs are providing better context, talking about the human devastation that a military intervention in Iran or North Korea would reap on the Iranian and, and Korean people. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, Trump doesn't view those news organizations other, to, other than to complain about the tone of their coverage of him. Uh, so when he does view news, and we know he watches Fox and Friends, 
what he's seen is this kind of propagandistic, exaggerated, maybe even fabricated uh, intelligence information coming from an unsubstantiated source that has a lot to personally benefit from if the United States were to intervene on their behalf in Iran. If he's seen this information on the news, what he's seen is the stuff that Fox and Friends is piping directly into his television and into his, uh, into his handset, into his phone. Um, and that's a real problem, how the media is able to influence Trump and how influence groups like the National Council of Resistance of Iran are potentially able to in influence Trump through his preferred media outlets. I got to be honest, you know, just, just hearing you lay that out, this is a guy who has access to top generals, to all of our most uh, you know, secret information to all of the agencies that that do this, and yet he's taking his his information from talking heads at Fox News. Yeah, I mean, it was widely reported on just on October 9th, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, which is one of the six constituent organizations that is responsible for inspecting this nuclear regime. The others are the Chinese, French, German. Uh, Russian, American, British, and Iranian governments, um, the IAEA said that Iran was in full compliance. The next day, the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, calls Donald Trump and personally asks him to stay in the Iran deal because Iran is fully compliant and because the deal is vital for regional and international security. And it seems to have not made a dent in his preconceived notions, in his preconceived conclusions about what the right path is. And unfortunately, the fact is, that the Iran deal is an Obama legacy project, and Trump is, if nothing else, very astute at dismantling all of the vestiges of the prior administration. This is really nothing, uh, something that we've never seen before. Right. Let me ask People you a stupid. Thought, let me ask you what might seem a stupid question, and it's it's kind of just an opinion question. Uh, do you think it's that simple? Do you really think that it's anything Obama did has to go? Because anything that you know, we've been telling ourselves for you know so long, he's bad, he's bad. That everything has to go, and and regardless of if this deal is working or if this agreement is working, and and if we're going in the right direction, regardless of that, it has to go. Is it that simple? Yeah, I mean, it certainly seems that way, and his media diet certainly seems to be influencing this this preconception, this misconception that he has that everything that Obama did has to be dismantled. It's important to remember, you know, all of the plans that Trump got behind in, with regard to repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act, every one of those plans would have taken health insurance coverage away from between 22 million and 32 million Americans, and he just kept supporting every single repeal plan that came yeah. up because it was going to repeal Obamacare, and he claimed Obamacare's failing, it's a disaster, it's hurting families. And that's because that's what he hears on Fox News. That's what he hears on Breitbart. That's what he hears on Rush Limbaugh's program and on Alex Jones's program. Even though it's not true, his media diet, his information system is entirely balanced uh, or entirely biased by um, these these right wing fringe characters who consider everything that that from the Obama legacy to be a disaster. So he legitimately seems to believe that everything that Obama did is a disaster and needs to be destroyed even when, in reality, many of those things are very good and benefiting hundreds of millions of people in the United States and around the world every single day. Now, I mean, scary, scary times when you look at uh, this with Iran and you know his ongoing feud with, with UN in North Korea. Uh, look, I don't know how big he I, I don't know how big he thinks our military is. I just don't know that you can do both uh, at the same time and then still uh, have all of our other obligations. I just this is nothing good here, nothing good. I mean, um, Trump certainly, he seems to have a very, like, he's, he seems like the, the sort of least common denominator of what you would expect with regard to someone's information diet. You know, everyone remembers in the wake of Benghazi, people had this sort of cartoonish implication, con cartoonish conception of how the military could have just flown fighter jets over and hot roped in and saved the troops if it really cared about it. And the reason that it became such a scandal uh, even though it wasn't a scandal at all, was because millions of people had a cartoonish perception of how the United States military operates, how the international diplomatic system works, and how the United States can just flex its muscles whenever they want. They essentially think the world is a Michael Bay film. And it seems every day uh, more and more confirmed that that's actually how Donald Trump thinks as well.
Scary, scary stuff. And as I said from the beginning, we'll talk about it when you're willing to put Ivanka, the little junior, uh, Eric, and maybe little Baron, and the one that nobody ever talks about. Put them on the front lines first, and we'll talk. That simple. But Craig, I appreciate the time, man. Great talking with you. Thank you. Always good talking to our friend Craig Harrington. Uh, Media Matters. Amazing, amazing stuff. Quick break. Right back with your thoughts. one 520 rick one 520 This is the Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to talk. Uncovering the con in conservatism. Rick Smith. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. Bury me with my boys in Mount Olive, and let no traitor draw breath over my grave. Such was the last wish of labor leader Mother Jones. She wanted her final resting place to be alongside the coal miners who gave their lives in the struggle to bring fair wages and a safe working environment to Verdun, Illinois. And on this day in labor history, the year was 1898. Members of the newly formed United Mine Workers of America were out on strike against the Chicago Verdin Coal Company mine. They demanded the company pay the new mining wage scale of 40 cents per ton of coal mine. The company refused. Worried that management would try to sneak in replacement workers, the striking men patrolled the railroad tracks leading to the mine. Both black and white strikers joined the lookout parties. Just a little afternoon on that fateful day, the men spotted a train coming toward them. It was loaded with strike breakers. African-American workers recruited from Alabama. Looking to escape the oppression of the South, the black workers had not been told about the labor unrest in Verdun. Many refused to work for the company once they learned the truth. The train was also packed with armed guards hired by the company. Determined not to let the replacement workers through, armed strikers met the train at the depot. A gun battle ensued. Eight miners were killed. Four armed guards also died. A month later, the union won its wage demands. Three of the union miners who lost their lives that day were laid to rest at the Mount Olive Union Miner Cemetery. It was these men who Mother Jones loved as her boys. A new dirt falling on a new made coffin. A new dirt falling on a new made coffin. On way over in that union. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Here's the simplest thing. Figure out an affordable rate and let people use that, something that won't undermine your quality of life, won't interfere with your ability to make expenses, won't interfere with your ability to save money for your kids' college education, and let people buy in to Medicare or Medicaid. I got a working class blues. I work all day to take all my class. Oh, you know, I got to be honest. Makes sense, right? Duh. So simple, even Bill Clinton gets it. Uh, open up Medicare. It's what I've been saying it for years, and, I, and a lot of people have. Look, for at least a decade, I've been saying, you know, just open up Medicare. Let young, healthy people buy into it. You make it solvent for years down the road. You have the, the network. You have the infrastructure already in place. And, oh, by the way, you get the added benefit of getting rid of the those high-priced CEOs and all of the the excessive forms, it, it would be so simple to do. Problem is, not any profit in it. And, you know, look, the profit is in, it's in denying you care. That's the reality. Uh, the, the profit is in saying, sorry, nothing for you. And I can't remember the movie. I think Matt Damon was in it uh, years and years ago, uh, where, you know, there was this woman whose son was sick, and she was fighting with the insurance company all the time. And they sent her a letter back going, you must be stupid, stupid, stupid to think we're going to pay for this. That's our future. Our future is uh, paying our premiums. And then if you get sick, if you're unfortunate enough to get sick, um, you're now fortunate enough to go broke. That's going to be the future. And as it's being reported today, uh, Trump is going to use the pen. And do you remember when, when Republicans were angry 
at the use of the pen. Remember when they said executive orders should be outlawed? No, I, no, no executive orders. Remember that? Yeah, I, I, I do too. Um, but today, the, the executive order pen is going to come out, supposedly. And we don't have all the details of how bad it's going to be. But the Donald's going to try and do what uh, his party was unable to do, and that is destroy the Affordable Care Act. And ultimately create uh, their talking point. Look, you know, Republicans are great at creating disaster and crisis. And then, of course, having a, a cute little tagline to go with it. Uh, so... Anybody who, who, who really pays attention to what's going on with the Affordable Care Act really understands that there's no death spiral going on. Uh, the marketplace is actually fairly robust in most areas. There are places that are having problems, but ha that has a lot to do with the fact that you have governors in those states who, <laughs> no, we're not doing it. Fingers in the ears, kicking, screaming, carrying on. But in most places, like Pennsylvania has a very robust marketplace. What this executive order is going to do, uh, from every expert, in fact, Karen uh, Pollitz, uh, she's a senior fellow at the Kaiser Family Foundation. Uh, they're one of the big healthcare think tanks. Uh, what she's saying is, look, you know, when this, when this executive order goes into place, within a year, this is going to kill the marketplace. It's going to kill it. And what they're going to do is, from what's being reported, what the plan is, what they're going to do is they're going to allow small businesses and, and organizations to, to band together and buy uh, cheap insurance. And again, as we've been saying, we've seen this movie before. The micro plans are coming back. Because what this is going to do is completely undercut the essential benefits uh, that are mandated in insurance plans now. You know... If you get sick, it's something should be covered. Uh, you know, preventative care. Well, you know what? You can pay for that out of your pocket. All of the things that are in the Affordable Act that I think most people like now going to be undercut by this executive order, which is going to, and I've seen uh, skimpy, cheap plans. I've seen uh, them characterized as loosely regulated uh, I, I've seen I've seen a whole bunch of, of verbiage on how bad this is. But the reality is what's going to happen is you're going to have people buying coverage, especially young, healthy people who are going to get a card or something, and they're going to think that they're insured, but didn't bother to read the fine print that you need a microscope and a law degree to figure out. And when they actually do get sick or you know something unfortunate happens, who knows, you're in a trampoline accident and you break your neck. There's no, there's nothing covering you there, and what, what the, in, what these people are hoping is that you'll, will buy these crummy plans, and, it'll, they'll cover nothing. They'll be able to cash in with huge, huge profits, and when you actually do get sick, you're eventually going to lose your job anyway, and you'll end up on Medicaid. You'll end up on the back of the, the taxpayer anyway. And again, you think of how insane this whole system is how we as the taxpayers take the the most expensive people to insure and put them on medicare and medicaid and yet the healthy people we want to give to the private sector so that they can profit off of them and you go wait a second should there be one insurance pool isn't that the basic rule of insurance the bigger the pool the the, the less risk evidently not for health insurance it's just it's crazy, crazy stuff. But today that's supposedly going to happen. And, and they're they're creating they're creating their death spiral. It's it's just well, it is what it is. Gonna take a quick break when we come back. Victoria Jones is gonna be here. Talk media news. Stick around. This is the Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Yes, it is all about the children, even after they're born. Rick Smith. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1899. That was the day Union Miners in Mount Olive, Illinois, began commemorating Miners Day. Every year, thousands came into town for a parade, music, and speeches. 
Mount Olive was the site of the only Union-owned cemetery in the United States, established by UMWA Local 728 in the aftermath of the Verdin Massacre. A year before to the day, striking miners had been killed in a shootout with company goons attempting to herd scabs into the mines in Verdin, Illinois. But, as Mother Jones biographer Elliot Gorn notes, the train never unloaded its cargo and the company was forced to settle. The Union hoped to erect a gravesite monument commemorating those miners who had been killed at Verdin, but they were refused by those who considered the fallen miners to be murderers and not martyrs. That's when the United Mine Workers established the Union Miners Cemetery. And on this day, 10,000 turned out for the Union's memorial ceremony. The United Mine Workers unveiled a monument dedicated to the fallen Verdin miners E.W. Smith, Joe Gitterly, Ernest Kramer, and E.F. Long. The day was filled with parades, music, laying of wreaths, and speeches. Haymarket widow and radical activist Lucy Parsons was among the speakers. In his book, Death and Dying in the Working Class, Michael Ross now notes that her presence drew a direct connection between the fallen miners and the Haymarket martyrs, cut down while advancing the cause of labor. Thousands traveled traveled to Mount Olive every year for celebrations, including Eugene V. Debs, Miners leader John Mitchell, and Mother Jones. In 1923, Mother Jones asked to be buried with her boys, noting they are responsible for Illinois being the best organized labor state in America. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. The most important issues of the day. This is the Rick Smith Show. president keeps talking about how you know those those people kneeling are disrespecting our flag they hate our country they hate our anthem they hate us uh, in fact he told Hannity you cannot disrespect our country our flag our anthem you cannot do that uh, and yet during the event yesterday here in Harrisburg uh, while the the bugle call uh, went out while the retreat bugle call was being played uh, you had Trump and Hannity uh, yucking it up over how the, it's, it's a nice sound, the president said. It's a nice sound. Uh, and he even asked Hannity if uh, they were playing the, the, the song in honor of his ratings. Yeah. Again, smokescreen. It's crazy. Anyway, let's find out what's going on in Washington, D.C. and around the world. Victoria Jones, Talk Media News. Victoria, thanks for taking time for us. Thank you very much. So big fun on the Trump front. In fact, all those lazy people in Puerto Rico, they just need to get up and get to work. Get up. Yeah. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up for yeah. you. Right. Yeah. That, yes. that, he's not singing that. I was listening to that this morning, actually. Uh, but that's a different context. Um Yes, exactly. And uh, the president seems to have based this series of three tweets partly on um, something that uh, reporter Cheryl Atkins has said on television and uh, that, set, that set him off, um, and, uh, the, and he, where she talked about how um, they had this e economic crisis before a financial crisis um, that you know, he says, says Cheryl Atkins and financial crisis looms largely of their own making. She's on the Sinclair Broadcast Group television stations. And um, so, you know, we cannot keep FEMA, the military, and the first responders who have been amazing under the most difficult circumstances in PR forever. You know, the, the FEMA and the other first responders have been in other uh, disaster areas for many months. Yep. Um, they were in uh, New Orleans for nearly a year um, former official in the George W. Bush administration noted that the federal government kept some military, um, uh, at, you know, in uh, uh, there for, for at least three other, three places. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, to me, as I, as I was looking at that, I was thinking that this is, this is businessman Trump who's trying to figure out a way to cheat somebody. 
you know, when he was cheating all the contractors who did work for him, all of the architects who who made plans and buildings that he built and the cleaning people. You just go down the list of all of the people that he stiffed over the years. It looked to me like one of those justifications of, well, you know what? Your country was a shambles anyway. We shouldn't have to re- re- rebuild it. It just seemed to me to be that kind of that kind of justification. Right. Exactly. It, yeah. uh, it's it's very uh, disturbing, um, and I think for the people of uh, Puerto Rico, uh, you know, who it's only three weeks after the hurricane, and 84 percent at least of them do not have access to, uh, you know, to to electricity. Right. 44 percent only have access to clean water. Yeah, but you know what? The, the infrastructure was terrible anyway. Yeah, they, they, hey, they're resilient. They'll figure it out. Right. On your own. You're, you're in an island in a big ocean. You'll figure it out. Yeah. It's, it's just well, not. It's, I but, don't you know who's going to figure that out. Yeah, but here's the thing. I mean, it's just all Trump all the time. Like yesterday, the you know, basically, we're gonna, evidently, we're going to start going after uh, NBC. We're going to start locking. Why don't we just start locking up journalists? How about, how about we'll come get you, Victoria? You said something bad. You spoke ill of the Donald. Well, um, maybe, maybe that's. You told the truth. You reported his words accurately. How dare you? It's, you know, there, it's, it's very disturbing that reporting is, is being attacked. And President Trump did another tweet this morning saying that, uh, that the press was demeaning and denigrating. They're bad. They're, they're, they're bad to me. Mom... I mean, I, come on. This just seems like the, the rantings of a two-year-old at this point. I mean, yeah, come on. You know, I can't imagine. You know, I, I was thinking about this the other day. You know, what if what if Obama had the same kind of thin skin and the same kind of idiotic reactions that we see coming out of the marmalade Mussolini? I mean, it's it's just it's it's mind blowing to me that I was talking about this with my daughter the other day. You know, in a hundred years, I wish I could be around so that when historians look back. Because this is going to be, all of these tweets are going to be part of the presidential record. When they look back and go, who in their right mind would have elected this guy? I want to see their reactions. You know, it's very, it's, uh, Steve Bannon um, said, and I, let me let me find this, I, I want to find this correctly. Because this was, I printed out a really interesting story in the Washington Post Um this morning uh, about how the the White House is really, really concerned about uh, President Trump's state of mind. Um, Steve Bannon uh, uh, has said uh, months ago, according to two sources with knowledge of the conversation, told Trump that the risk to his presidency wasn't impeachment, but the 25th Amendment, the provision by which a majority of the cabinet could vote to remove the president, when Bannon mentioned the 25th Amendment, Trump said, what's that? <laughs> um, according to a source, Bannon has told people he thinks Trump has only a 30% chance of making it the full term. No, I don't think he does either. But you know, And this all this talk of you know, 2020, really? You're, you're quite optimistic because I don't know that you make it past the midterms. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. I mean, it, it, look, uh, I didn't think that this kind of insanity would be normalized. Uh, but I have people who go, I, I, I'm not paying attention anymore. No, it's, it's in the White House where it's not. I mean, there are people uh, in the White House who are, you know, who are very, very, very concerned yeah. about this. Apparently. No, I, I agree. I, I understand. Uh, but, you know, I wonder about we the people. I mean, and look, Corker came out, you know, I think part of what Corker's thing was is kind of opening that door a little bit. But we'll see. We'll let the fun begin uh, today. The big the big news today. We're going to we're going to create the death spiral. Uh, the Republicans have been talking about a death spiral. Uh, evidently, the power of the pen uh, going to might create that. Well, and, you know, it's already started in a way in terms of, we're talking about Obamacare now in terms of things like the sign ups, you know, the um, the sign up period. Uh, there isn't there isn't going to be any publicity for that. Nope. So people aren't going to know about it, although, you know, some Democrats are going to try and 
make it known. But so, you know, when they when they then announced, we see so many le- fewer people signed up. Well, there's a reason for that because they didn't know they could sign up. Yep. And, and then look, there's there was a lot of money in you know different groups going out and signing people up because not everyone has access to the internet. Right. And right. you know, it's one of those things where, you know, the policy under the Obama term was we need to get people signed up. We need to get everybody in. It's got to be an all-inclusive thing if it's going to work. The Trump the Republican version is if we can keep exclude people, we can point out that what we've been saying is is true that it's failing and then we can completely destroy it. And justifiably so. It's 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 the opposite. So today the, the president opposite. is going to sign an executive order, and it, that will relax health standards, health care standards on small businesses that band together to buy health insurance. He may take steps to allow the sale of other health plans that skirt the health laws requirements. Yeah, so we're we're going back to the micro plans. You know, you'll have a card in your wallet. It's not going to cover anything, but at least you'll have that right. warm fuzzy feeling that the card is in your wallet. And the worst part about this is, and, and this is you know what I've been talking about for the last couple of days, is that if you really do get sick and you need one of these plans that are going to cover nothing, eventually you end up on the back of the taxpayer anyway and Medicaid dollars, which he's also cutting. So ultimately, there's going to be not even that safety net of the Medicaid dollars to help take care of people when tragedy strikes. Yeah, these some of these, they're also going to be addressing these short-term policies, which only cover you for up to three months. Um, They don't satisfy the coverage requirements of Obamacare, and uh, so people might be subject to tax penalties, but they they don't cover much. And uh, in the past, some of these plans failed because they did not have enough money to pay their customers' medical bills. And, um, you know, some of the companies were accused of misleading people about exactly what the plans would cover. Yep. No, I, I, I met a guy a couple years ago, I guess about a year and a half ago now. Uh, he, he was a truck driver, you know, like me. I, I work on the weekends, and I met this guy. He goes, I can sell you really cheap insurance. And I go, really? He goes, you know, it's, it's much cheaper than the insurance you can get here. And I go, well, I don't get my insurance through. And he goes, it's really cheap. It's like 200 bucks a month. And I go, well, what does it cover? He goes, well, I, I don't really know. And I'm going, oh. I'm going, what? You're selling insurance, but you don't know what it is. He goes, but it's cheaper. And I'm going, you know, this is what's wrong with this whole system. When you've got, you know, these these kind of hucksters out there going, hey, it's cheaper. That that must be better. Uh, that scares me. It terrifies me. I want my health insurance to cover something when I get sick. Yeah, I mean, and I think most people are like that. Look, uh, you know, I, I just want, I want to know that when I go to the doctor, um, you know, I'm going to be taken care of. And when I leave the doctor's office, I'm not going to have a heart attack because of the bill. Uh, it yeah. seems to be, you know, self-defeating that if I go to the doctor, he helps me and then he kills me with the bill. Uh, it just seems kind of self-defeating. Uh, but again, yeah. you know, we're not having those conversations. To me, one, I agree with Rand Paul. One insurance pool. That's it. That's all we need. Medicare for all. Simple. Uh, although Rand Paul doesn't go there. Uh, what, what's going on with, with puppies and kittens? I made that up. That was fake news. Oh, fake news. So Trump so Trump isn't anti-puppies and kittens. Well, he he did refuse to get a dog. But, yeah, but no. he shouldn't have a dog. No. I, I see him as a guy, and you know maybe this, is, maybe this is a bridge too far, but I see him as the guy who comes home and kicks the dog. You don't know that at all. He would more. I don't know. You'd have no idea what he would do. You I, just I'm just. That. That's more I'm, fake news. I'm fake I'm, news on the Rick Scott show. I, Smith. <laughs> all right then, whatever. <laughs> That's more fake news. More fake news. No, I, I, I'm not saying this is news. It's my opinion. This is not a news show. This is an opinion. These are my opinions and my thoughts. I don't. I don't portray myself as news. So no, I no, can't no, be fake. No. <laughs> there no. you go. So anyway, he loves dogs and puppies, right? And kittens. I don't know that either. All right, so there you go. I, I have no knowledge no f- of this issue. I just put that in because it was it was the third line that I could put Trump threatens in. All right, the fifth you. line, the fifth line that I could put Trump threatens in. So it was fun. There you go. I love it. It was fun. Victoria, appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Victoria Jones, Talk Media News. Quick break. Right back.
Radio of, for, and by, we the working people. The Rick Smith Show. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to thericksmithshow.com. If you've missed any portion of the program, you can download the podcast at thericksmithshow.com. You're listening to Win Workers Independent News, a Diversified Media Enterprises production. I'm Doug Cunningham. The NFL Players Association says that NFL players are union members and part of the labor movement that has woven the fabric of America for generations. The Players Union says some players have decided to use their platform to peacefully raise awareness to issues that deserve attention. The NFL Players Association says we should not stifle these discussions and cannot allow our rights to become subservient to the very opinions our Constitution protects. Meanwhile, WBAP 820 AM in Fort Worth, Texas, says that Local 100 of United Labor Unions is filing NLRB charges against Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones over the NFL player protests. That union says NFL players have the right of concerted action to protest under the National Labor Relations Act. The complaint says Jones's efforts now to force players not to protest during the national anthem violates the players' rights to concerted action under the NLRA. A planned strike strike by hundreds of part-time faculty at Tufts University got canceled Wednesday when a tentative new labor agreement was reached. A CIU Local 509 says the five-year tentative deal improves wages and teaching conditions for the part-time faculty. Part-time faculty at Tufts voted to unionize in 2014. More than half of the part-time faculty will see pay raises of 22.5% over the five-year agreement. Others will get a minimum of 12.5% pay hikes. Finding themselves constrained by a legal challenge to their efforts to form a union at the University of Minnesota, faculty there are moving away from the traditional NLRB union election model and to a workers' association instead. Anna Kurhajic is a lecturer in American Studies at the University of Minnesota. We wanted to start doing things that actually could, you know, get us some wins and build some organizing around issues, find opportunities to build solidarity with other workers and students on campus. So we talked about moving away from the traditional unionization model and going towards the workers' association, which for us opens up a lot of possibilities. We're really, really excited about it. Kurhajic says the legal challenge would have divided faculty along class lines between tenure and non-tenure contingent faculty. That class difference was unacceptable to pro-union faculty. Across the board at all of our meetings, tenure-track faculty refused to be classed differently than our colleagues who have contingent appointments. A really important step of solidarity for us. University of Minnesota faculty are hoping that their workers' association enables solidarity and more powerful organizing with many other workers beyond the faculty. Win is America's multimedia news voice for workers. We need to make more money. You know, what they're paying us, a greedy corporation, they just want to pay us what they want to pay us. And it's not right. Support WIN's worker news mission at workersindependentnews.com. You've been listening to WIN, Workers Independent News. For more information, visit workersindependentnews.com. Rebuilding America. The Rick Smith Show. Back to the Rick Smith Show. Check out the website, therigsmithshow.com. So the Twitter in chief up this morning, bright and early, tweeting out how those lazy people in Puerto Rico, that's it. We're not staying. Crazy. I mean, just crazy. This guy's president. Uh, pointing the finger that it's all their fault. Their infrastructure terrible. It's all their fault. You know, that's, that's their problem. That's basically what he said today. Uh, he said that we're not going to keep FEMA and the military and first responders uh, there forever. So the heck with you people. Been there three weeks. Three weeks. Uh, Katrina, there were people there, like like Victoria said, over a year. Uh, and what's interesting to me is, you know, everything that's going around with Puerto Rico. And first, if you remember, first it was those greedy truck drivers uh, who were using the disaster there in Puerto Rico uh, to strike for higher wages, which was complete and total bunk, made up by some right-wing conservative uh, idiotic website that Fox News eventually regurgitated, and it got between the ears of the president, who then ultimately regurgitated the same thing. We need those truckers to get back to work, lazy as they are. Uh, then it was, you know, the people of Puerto Rico, they're just lazy, and they want everything done for them. Uh, then it was the onerous regulations and the bureaucratic red tape. And now, well, it's the, it's the Jones Act. Uh, that's the problem. We need to repeal that. We need to deregulate. 
Uh, we need to open up. That's going to solve all of our problems. Uh, and I, all, I'm all i all fronts completely disagree, but here to talk about the Jones Act and what it is. I, most people don't even know. That's why I've asked Larry Willis to come talk with us. He's president of the Transportation Trades Department of the AFL-CIO. Larry, thanks for taking time for us. Hey, thank you. Happy to uh, happy to do it as always. So you know, we hear about this this Jones Act, and you know, there's a lot of this stuff that pops up. Been around a long time. Tell me real quick, what what is the Jones Act? Yeah, you're right, and there's there's been a lot of confusion about it, and and all all the Jones Act says is that if you are going to ship goods from a U.S. point to a U.S. point, that the vessel uh, needs to be U.S. built, uh, crewed by U.S. mariners, and U.S. owned, and you know, look, the reason that we have that is because, you know, foreign shipping, you, 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 you allow these ships to flag any country in the world. They can come in there uh, and try to undercut on wages and working conditions um, and really present an unfair advantage to, to U.S. mariners um, and U.S. shipbuilders. Uh, we need a good U.S. Uh, merchant marine, a U.S. good maritime industry in this country because, you know, not only do they create these good jobs in, in shipbuilding um, and operating the ships, but they are crucial to our U.S. defense. Because in times of war, in times of humanitarian crisis where we need to move uh, goods across the world, the U.S. military doesn't maintain the type of sea lift uh, capability that, that we need. They turn to U.S. commercial vessels. Uh, to move those type of cargoes. And and those vessels and those mariners can only exist economically if you have laws like the Jones Act um, that protect that trade. So it's very important from a U.S. jobs perspective. It's very important from a U.S. Uh, military and defense perspective. Um, and on the flip side, it has absolutely nothing to do with the problems that Puerto Rico is experienced. Those problems are very real, both in terms of the immediate humanitarian problems that we're seeing because of the hurricane and their broader economic challenges. But those issues uh, are not caused or or exasperated by the Jones Act. No, it just seems to me this is a uh, one of those never let a good crisis go to waste. Because uh, here's the thing. Uh, it, you, you would think that what you laid out, the idea that you have uh, American-made ships, the people on them are Americans, uh, you know, that we control. It would seem that that would lay right into the Trump idea of hire Americans and uh, and buy American. And, and you would seem that that would be an, an absolute non-starter with this administration. And really the Republicans who have, who have really tried to take that mantle of, you know, we care about the American worker. Well, look, and I think that is why there has been bipartisan support historically, you know, for the Jones Act and other laws and policies that, um, you know, promote and preserve, you know, a U.S. maritime presence. You know, as, as I said earlier, you know, the problems that Puerto Rico faces today um, are not because there's not capacity of, of U.S. vessels. There's, there's ample capacity to get goods from the mainland of Puerto Rico. Um, the problems that we are seeing, and we are hearing this from our, from our maritime members, we are hearing it from members on the island, is that goods are being um, stacked at the ports. Uh, they can't get to the people in need throughout the island because because of those lazy tr those lazy greedy truck drivers, right? Exactly, right. It's 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 all the other you know. So, and 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 again, you've got a president who's tweeting, as you pointed out this morning, you know. You know, screw Puerto Rico, threatening to, to not provide the aid um, and the support that that's absolutely you know critical. You know, just two weeks, him and the vice president were talking about how we're going to be there for as long as 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 it takes. How quickly they have forgotten uh, that we have an obligation to the U.S. citizens uh, on that island and, and and to Puerto Rico to do what is is needed to bring that uh, to bring that region you know back completely and. Um, to, to divert people that the Jones Act is somehow to blame here really is a disservice to the re, to the relief efforts that need to occur and to the economic development support that needs to occur on the island more long term. Well, let me ask you the other part of this, because the, the president eventually and it was it was later than I think most people would have wanted, did give grant a waiver to the Jones Act to allow some some foreign vessels to come drop aid off from other countries. 
Uh, that's that's been kind of standard procedure, hasn't it? Well, they've they've traditionally uh, there have been waivers granted in the past, you know, as they've been needed when when U.S. capacity has not been present. But here's here's the truth of what happened during that 10 day waiver. Not a single foreign vessel used that waiver to deliver goods to Puerto Rico. And the reason is, I said before, because there was ample U.S. capacity to transport goods from, from, the, from the mainland, from Florida, for example, to Puerto Rico. That has never been the problem. The Jones Act doesn't apply when you are transporting goods from a foreign country to Puerto Rico. You, you can do that right now. You can do that in emergency uh, situations, in non-emergency situations, in regular commercial traffic. So the, the Jones Act has nothing to do with transporting goods from any foreign country to the island. Um, and again, when the waiver was in place, not a single foreign vessel took advantage of it because there was ample uh, capacity on U.S. vessels. Wow, that, uh, that I had not heard before and actually mm-hmm. did not know. And in fact, you know, part of you know, what, how it was explained to me by someone is that, you know, everything that goes to Puerto Rico, which is why things are so expensive, has to come to the U.S. mainland and then be shipped to them. That's not accurate? That is, that is 100% not accurate. And if it is coming from a foreign country, the Jones Act simply does not apply. And there's no you know, special tax or duty or, or whatever else is, in, is imposed. That just simply doesn't exist. All the Jones Act says is that if you ship from Jacksonville, Florida, to another U.S. port, whether it be in Puerto Rico or up and down the East Coast, then you need to use a U.S. maritime vessel. If the Jones Act applied to foreign, you know, to foreign commerce to, to Puerto Rico, um, you know, that would violate all sorts of international shipping norms. You know, so that 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 is that simply does not occur. So this is just pure opportunism. I mean, uh, th- there's nothing there's nothing here then uh, that would tell me that in any way, shape, or form is Puerto Rico being deprived of any assistance from anywhere around the world. And the messaging that I've seen out of this is is disingenuous, and it's just pure political opportunism. Yeah, I th- look, I think that's right. And I think, look, the, the people that are pushing this are, are sort of two types of people. One is foreign shipping interests who simply um, want a shot at providing uh, you know, traffic between the U.S. mainland and, and, and Puerto Rico. And when, they, and when they provide that traffic, let's understand what they're doing here. They are paying, uh, they are operating vessels that are paying uh, terrible wages to foreign, crew, to foreign crews. They are operating vessels that uh, would never pass Munster from a safety and from an environmental perspective if they were, if they were U.S. vessels. Um, and then you have ideologues uh, in the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House who simply just don't believe that there should be any protections in place to create good middle-class jobs. And, and the, those are the two things that are going on here. It's, it, it is not based on a real need uh, to get goods to Puerto Rico, again, on, on an emergency basis or on regular long-term commercial needs. Uh, it's it's well again. I'm I'm glad you you cleared that up, and I I hope. Well, that's people... why. Look, that's why we are having these type of conversations. I think I'll, there there has been a lot of misinformation about it. Uh, there are people that um, you know want to desperately help the citizens of Puerto Rico. The labor movement completely and 100 uh, percent agrees with the need to to get assistance to the islands. Uh, the labor movement is on the ground right now, as as you know. No, I actually uh, signed up to go. Uh, hopefully, go. if they go again, I'm if they do it, if they send another ju- another junket of folks. I'm gonna, uh, I've signed up to go for that as well. Um, and not only you know responding to the immediate um, humanitarian crisis, but the labor movement for years has been talking about an economic um, package and a and a proper stimulus package for the island, uh, so that it can get out of the of the of the debt and and the unfair. Uh, economic issues that have that, that have been imposed on 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 the island, right? Uh, but the Jones Act is not part of that, right? And also, you know, beyond beyond just what we've been talking about, is to in, in you know rebuild their infrastructure, maybe in a way that every time one of these storms happens, you you don't see the whole island being basically washed away. I mean, you know, as you pointed out, the the reason that the humanitarian aid isn't getting from the the ships to the ports, the ports to the people, is because of the roads, the infrastructure is just completely devastated. 
And for me, the you know, looking down the road as someone who wants to be proactive, the idea of building an infrastructure that's going to be able to withstand the next uh, massive hurricane, because we know uh, whether you believe in climate change or not, we know these, strongs, these storms are getting bigger and stronger and more frequent, and they're not going away. It just seems to me smart investment is where we should be looking. Well, look. You know, that's what we did after Hurricane Sandy. We, we invested a lot of money, uh, not only to repair the infrastructure, but to make it resilient uh, to the next storm. And that's got to be the right policy. And there's simply no reason why uh, what, we, what we did for the, for the New York, New Jersey region uh, can't and shouldn't be done for, for Puerto Rico. Uh, and that, that needs to be our focus going forward. Uh, the labor movement is absolutely committed uh, to that outcome. You know, we don't invest enough across the board in our infrastructure uh, and places like Puerto Rico that, that don't have the political voice that they should, quite frankly, uh, really get underserved. And I, and I think that you're seeing that today. And last question I've got for you, anything we can do to push back? I mean, look, I know there's legislation banging around back under the, the Jones Act. Is it, what should we be doing to, to make sure that that doesn't move forward? Well, we need to continue to have, um, you know, conversations and really you know, call out public officials here for the for the very real problems that the island has experienced, and we cannot, we you know, we can't gloss over that. Uh, we have to identify the real sort of economic policies that need to be put in place uh, longer term. We need to invest in Puerto Rico's infrastructure, but we need to make it clear uh, that that the Jones Act uh, is not an impediment uh, to the to the you know dealing with the immediate humanitarian crisis, that there are problems on the island that are preventing goods um, from getting to those in need. And we need, we need to solve that problem. Yeah, I'm with you. Larry, I appreciate the time. Thanks so much for clearing things up for us. Thank you. Always great talking to you, Larry Willis, president of the Transportation Trades Department there of the, at the AFL-CIO. Quick break, right back, 1-888-520-RICK, 1-888-520-7425. This is the Rick Smith Show. We're working people come to talk till the end, and we're not gonna break tonight and we're not gonna bend some say the union's down but i asked around and everybody said this is a union town a union town all down the line this is a union town a union town all down the line and if they come to strip our rights away we'll give them hell every time this is a union town a union Remembering that united we bargain, divided we beg. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1845. That was the day that the first Industrial Congress of the United States met in New York City. People interested in the problems facing working people, including long hours, low pay, and unsafe working conditions, gathered together. The labor movement was just beginning in this country. These were the years when the early trade unions were formed. Women played an important role in the early labor movement. Female textile mill workers in Lawrence, Massachusetts, began to organize for the 10-hour day. In 1844, they established the Lowell Female Labor Reform Association. Their goal was to improve working conditions in the mills. The Lowell Women's Group sent a representative to New York for the Labor Congress. Another important development of the fledgling labor movement was the establishment of labor presses. George Henry Evans, a labor newsman, also attended the Congress. He was the editor of a series of U.S. labor papers, starting with the Workmen's Advocate in 1829. He had come to the United States from England, where he had been involved in the trade labor movement. He also attended the Labor Congress. The meeting recommended the formation of three organizations. First was an industrial brotherhood for workers, including farmers. The second was an industrial sisterhood for women workers. The third was a group for friends of labor. The Congress met again in New York in 1847, then again met in Chicago in 1850. These early efforts to establish larger labor groups did not gain much traction, but they began to lay the framework for workers to come together to discuss their challenges and imagine how they could work together to bring about change for better wages, shorter hours, and safer working conditions. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Not right wing. 
just right. The Rick Smith Show. I've been saying for a while. I mean, you look at the messaging that came out of Puerto Rico, and right away, I mean, and I've hit on this a couple of times, uh, the that accusation that the drivers were, uh, they were striking because they were greedy, they wanted more money, completely, completely fabricated. And, you know, and I guess, you know, my problem is, is we're so, so short-sighted in our thinking that you go, oh, well, there's all this humanitarian stuff there. It's the same thing with sending, uh, you know, relief aid to, you know, any third world developing nation. Uh, you know, and the, you hear the stories of, you know, there are, you know, there are you know, thousands of pounds of grain and there, you know, there's all of this stuff just sitting on the docks rotting. And you go, yeah, there's a reason for that. They don't have a transportation network like we have. The fact that you can get pla- places here simply uh, and in multiple routes, we take for granted. When the one road to get across uh, the river is is flooded, you don't get to the other side. When all of the power lines are down and the only road to get to the other side of town is now covered in, in downed power lines, you don't get to the other side. And, and, and I guess, you know, I, it's one of those things where maybe critical thinking skills aren't, aren't front and center. But you look at the infrastructure, and look, we're going to face a time in this country where you go down into, into southern Florida, where there, there aren't a whole lot of ways to get around. And as the infrastructure there uh, is constantly under assault from these storms, we're going to face a lot of those same things here. And there's always been part of me that goes, you know, and I know, I know this is crazy thinking. I know this is just a, you know, just, you know, utopian uh, kind of, of, you know, just down the road thinking. But the fact that, you know, maybe in those areas where you have these kind of storms often, maybe you should be prepared for it. Maybe we should be, you know, Florida, Texas, Louisiana, uh, Puerto Rico, you know, warehouses full of, of stuff waiting ready to be distributed strategically in areas that we know eventually when the power lines go down or the roads get washed out, that there's something there. And I know that's, that's, you know, that, that's that whole squirrel something away for a rainy day thing. We can't do that. That doesn't make any sense. It's, it's really just, it's mind blowing to me. And the other thing that I've been, I've been talking about for a while is this idea that, you know, maybe Wake up to the reality that these storms are getting more frequent. In fact, I just saw something that uh, I guess we've had 10 uh, major hurricanes that have made landfall. And um, that's the most since like 1893. And again, you know, whether whether you believe in climate change or not, whether you believe that man-made global warming is, is causing all this or not, reality has to play into this game at some point. Setting aside all of the debate over whether it's real or not, and I I believe that you continue to burn stuff, uh, you continue to send pollution and smoke up into the air, you continue to do these things, pollute our air and water, there are long-term consequences to it. I believe that. But even if I didn't, the facts are there. Water's getting warmer. Uh, With the water getting warmer, it's causing more intense storms. Those are facts. And with more intense storms comes more damage. With more damage comes more cost, more uh, more loss of human life, more loss of, of infrastructure, and maybe starting to think of how you rebuild in ways that, well, you mitigate some of the risks. And it's it's bizarre to me that the, the EPA and the Trump administration did away with the Obama-era regulations on future building uh, to think of, hey, in the future when we build something, Maybe just a thought. We should think about how this is going to impact the people who are here in future storms. Like maybe you shouldn't be building in a flood in a floodplain. And if you do, maybe you should be building in a way that says, okay, when it comes, and we know it will. These are the these are the infrastructures. These are the the precautions that we've taken to protect not just human life, but the infrastructure as a whole. Are we capable of doing that as a country? I don't know. 
I think the average person, when you sit down and you lay it out in, in very stark terms of saying, look, you know, you look good onto the beach. You see all those houses up on stilts. Wasn't always like that. Someone said, hey, let's put them up on stilts so that when the water comes in and then we know it's going to, it goes right underneath. Again, sane, rational, but ideological. I mean, for me, Puerto Rico could be, with it being wiped out and the billions of dollars that are going to have to be spent uh, to rebuild and to, and to help those folks, which we absolutely have to do, uh, no matter what Trump and and the right and the Sinclair Broadcasting and all those well, all those people are saying, you have to you it's a U.S. territory. They want to be a state. They voted for statehood. You have to rebuild it, but we we should be doing it in a way that that really just starts to think in the in the 21st century, where climate change is real, where these storms are getting worse and more powerful, where we think about how do we create infrastructure that that isn't going to be washed away every time a storm hits. You know, I know disaster capitalism is profitable for some. You know, human misery is always profitable for somebody. But at, at some point, we as taxpayers, don't we have to be the ones who go, you know, if we're going to be spending all these dollars, shouldn't we be doing it in a way that, yeah, I don't know, the lowest bidder doesn't get the, get, the, get the bid? You know, the guy who's going to use the cheapest material to slap something up? It's always amazing to me that, that we, we rebuild trailer homes in, in Florida. It's always been amazing to me. Uh, you know, why, aren't, why isn't every house in Florida made out of brick? You know why? Why? Why is it? You know why? You know why? Why? You know why isn't every house in Florida the bottom three feet of the wall uh, made of removable uh, drywall that's water resistant? I mean, because you, you think of all of these things that we're not doing, and it's just it's short sighted. But again, somebody's profiting from it, and the reason we're not going to get away from fossil fuels, somebody, someone's profiting from it. Evidently, we're making coal great again. And, you know, I, you know, the president wants to take credit for bringing some coal jobs back. Is he going to take equal credit for making black lung great again? Uh, look, I'm, I'm all in favor of, you know, coal miners having jobs. But as a country, shouldn't we be moving forward in the idea that we can be energy independent? We can create enough energy from renewable sources to power our economy in a way that we're not killing the workers and, and harming the overall society. I mean, just really, because you know, there's part of me that goes, and I guess I'm old enough to remember leaded gasoline. I remember sitting in traffic as a kid, unable to breathe at all because of the leaded gasoline, just, just you're just billowing out of these giant, uh, engined cars that had no pollution control whatsoever on them. You know, my kids don't don't know that reality because we had smart policy. We said, you know, this is probably a bad thing. People are are dying. Probably a bad thing. We should probably stop it. And we did. And within a, you know, a generation, acid rain, nobody talks about. In fact, you tell someone near them, we had acid rain when I was a kid, they look at you like you're crazy. That was caused because the leaded gasoline was emitting fumes into the atmosphere. That's reality. So to me, again, you these these disasters, these crises, there are opportunities. There are opportunities to do the right thing, to make smart decisions. Having a on a, on a place like Puerto Rico, having a decentralized electric grid is a good start. Having numerous grids across the island would be a smart start so that the entire island can't be knocked out. In fact, we should probably think about that here. I mean, we do some of it. Just a thought. Just a thought. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can email me, rick at the rick.smithshow.com. I'm going to take a quick break right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people from the top. 10% of the people own 90% of the wealth. Where do you fit in? Take a look at yourself. 10% of the people own 90% of the wealth. 
where smart policy and sound investment matters. The Rick Smith Show. This is my neighborhood in flames, completely in flames. <laughs> Fast moving, deadly wildfires sweep across Northern California wine country. Harvey, Irma, and Maria could make 2017 one of the top years for weather disasters. 2017 on pace to shatter weather disaster record. 2017 also breaks a record for Atlantic hurricanes, and it ain't over yet. Plus, the White House argues that the Obama era regulations have been burdensome. To the economy and American workers. Trump's EPA moves to repeal Obama's landmark clean power plan. Great timing. All of those stories and more straight ahead. From Bradblog.com, I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyan. Stand by for six minutes of independent green news, politics, analysis, and snarky comment. You know, regulatory power should not be used by any regulatory body to pick winners and losers. Unless the winners are the fossil fuel industry who get $20 billion in tax breaks and subsidies every year. Am I right, EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt? This is your Green News Report. Okay, Desi Doyen, I think many of us were breathing a sigh of relief after Hurricane Nate began to break up, only to see these horrific, devastating fires now out here in Northern California. Yes, as we go to air in Northern California's wine country, at least 10 people are now confirmed dead. 50 are missing in extremely fast-moving, heat- and wind-driven wildfires that have forced the evacuations of more than 20,000 people, including two hospitals. California's fire chief announced Monday that at least 1,500 structures have been destroyed. He said that was a conservative estimate. The wine country fires are among 14 large wildfires now burning in California. And they are just exploding across Northern California and some down here in Southern California, wiping out homes overnight, uh, just horrendous. And as you mentioned, Hurricane Nate made landfall on the Mississippi coast over the weekend as a Category 1 after killing at least 28 people in Central America. 2017 is now the most active Atlantic hurricane season in the modern record. For the first time since the 1890s, the Atlantic Basin has generated eight consecutive storms that developed into hurricanes. And hurricane season isn't over until November 30th. In Puerto Rico, Governor Ricardo Rosseo has asked Congress for additional financial assistance, warning that Hurricane Maria's catastrophic damage has crashed Puerto Rico's economy, deepening the humanitarian crisis. Distribution of aid remains the biggest hurdle three weeks after the storm, but there is some positive news. Governor Rosseo confirmed he is in talks with Tesla CEO Elon Musk over Musk's proposal to rebuild Puerto Rico's electric grid as a proof of concept for a large-scale renewable energy system with battery storage. With clean, renewable energy across the entire island, wouldn't that be fantastic? So I'm sure the Trump administration will get in the way and put a stop to that. On Friday, NOAA announced that 2017 is on track to be a record year for billion-dollar weather disasters. Since January, the U.S. has already experienced 15 extreme weather disasters costing more than a billion dollars each. That matches the number of disasters in 2011 and is second only to 2016. On average, there used to be only five or six. The year ain't over yet. But even as the U.S. faces a record year for extreme weather, the Trump administration is rolling back another major tool for fighting climate change, taking the first formal step to repeal President Obama's landmark clean power plan. That's the first ever regulations to limit the carbon emissions from U.S. power plants that cause dangerous global warming. The clean power plan is key to reducing the U.S. contribution to climate change and is crucial to the U.S. meeting its international pledge to reduce emissions under the U.N. Paris Climate Accord. And it also convinced China to join as well. But in remarks in Kentucky cold country on Monday, Environmental Protection Agency Administrator Scott Pruitt claimed the EPA overstepped its authority. You know, regulatory power should not be used by any regulatory body to pick winners and losers. The past administration was unapologetic. They were using every bit of power, every bit of authority to use the EPA to pick winners and losers and how we generate electricity in this country. 
Pruitt's claim is wildly contradictory. It comes on the heels of a proposal by the Department of Energy to intervene in electricity markets with new subsidies to prop up the ailing coal and nuclear industries, which have proven unable to compete against cheaper wind, solar, and natural gas. And most states are already on track to meet the plan's emissions targets at a lower cost than previously projected. The fossil fuel industry praised Pruitt's move. States and environmental groups have vowed to use every tool to challenge the repeal in court. Now, the repeal is only the first step in a long process that could drag on for years. Crucial time lost in the fight against climate change. Crucial time lost, but apparently no hypocrisy lost. Not by this administration. For much more on all of these stories and the ones we couldn't get to today, please check out our website at greennews.bradblog.com. Don't forget you can download our reports anytime via Stitcher, TuneIn, or iTunes. Find us, follow us, and share us worldwide on the Facebooks and the Twitters at Green News Report. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyne. And this has been your Green News Report. Smith Show. Check out the website, thericksmithshow.com. So we've seen an awful lot about the kneeling. How dare those people kneel during the NFL games? They're disrespecting the flag. So, well, again, uh, I look at what, th- what Trump has done and masterfully completely taken what the protests by the NFL players were uh, completely out of the equation. Uh, and look, uh, I'm actually all in, in favor of people having the right to to kneel, I'm not going to do it, but I think everyone should have the right to. But again, you go back to this, why are they doing it? Uh, the treatment of African Americans and minorities in this country, uh, in most places, is abysmal. It's terrible, it's horrible, and it's unfair. And what they were saying, they're highlighting the fact that this is what's going on. And no more is this, well, this discrimination, this inequality uh, evident than in our criminal justice system. And this week, on Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, you had community leaders, uh, activists, uh, criminal justice folks, uh, elected officials, business people, all kinds of people coming together in New York City for the Smart on Crime Innovations Conference. And here to talk about what went on at the conference, I've got Ed Chung. He's the vice president of the Criminal Justice Policy Program there at the Center for American Progress. Ed, thanks for taking time for us. Hey, Rick. Thanks for having me. So... Give me a broad overview. What was what were you guys talking about? Yeah, well, I like the fact that you started here with talking about the kneeling and so forth, because one of the key people that we had was former NFL wide receiver Anquan Bolden, who was talking exactly about these issues and the going beyond the kneeling aspect of what's going on in the criminal justice system and in policing across the community. And so what we did was we brought together uh, – exactly the people that you said, business leaders, activists, communities, foundations, people who are working at this. And there's a lot of rhetoric out there that are that's looking to put policies back in place that really focus, again, on arresting more people and incarcerating more people. And across the country, cities and states are saying that there's a better way to do this. There's a smarter way to do this. And so we looked at different parts of or different strategies that are being used whether it is in policing or whether it's in community activism or whether it's technology, things that are ap- actually happening on the ground. Because you need more than speeches. You need more than rhetoric. We need to show people what is actually happening in communities across the country. And there's a lot going on. Yeah, there is a lot. But, you know, I look at the rhetoric coming out of the White House and, you know, you got Donald Trump who's, you know, the bad hombres. And all we need to do is let police do their jobs. You know, all these people are getting in the way. Um, you know, that messaging, I think, is is – well, it's dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely dangerous. And it's also then buttressed by the fact that his attorney general is changing policies and regret, taking us back. And this is, not a, this is not just rhetoric that I'm saying. This is actually what is happening, taking us back to policies that have already been discredited. So when you're talking about uh, DOJ funding or federal law enforcement efforts, 
putting more emphasis on arrests and then telling U.S. attorneys that we need to address violent crime through more arrests and we're going to up those numbers. And the Bureau of Prisons is projecting uh, more people incarcerated because of these changes in policies. That's a real problem. So we really need to work with our local law enforcement, local communities to say that is not the only way. There is a different way. And there are police leaders, community leaders, and prosecutors and others that are changing things. We just need to show people more uh, through this conference, through what's happening afterwards, um, but also way beyond that. Right, but the simple messaging, Ed, is that uh, these criminals need to be punished. I mean, there's there's that, that basic... Uh, you know, playing to our natural bit of fairness. You break the law, you know, go back to the, you know, the 70s TV show Beretta. If you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Yeah, and so th- there's two parts to this. I don't think we, we had a lot of people who were formerly incarcerated and just involved at this conference. And I don't think anybody is accountable for your actions. What's the best way to make sure that public safety is enhanced and those people who have served their time are and have been held accountable are now productive members of society. So that's on the one side. But then on the front side, the question is whether or not our laws are actually doing the right thing by, quote unquote, holding people accountable through our criminal justice system and keeping them in prison and jails much longer, or even in the first place, putting them in prison and jails for social issues. I mean, you look at the issue of violent crime in this country, and we always demonize people for being violent people. I th- but the difference here is that being labeled a violent person under the criminal justice system has a real stigma attached, even though they may not have committed more violent acts than other people around the country in, in terms of, you know, bar fights or getting in fights with, you know, th- different places and so forth, right. so or different people. And so there's a real issue of how we treat social issues, whether the criminal justice system is the appropriate method to do that. Yeah, and it's always been insane to me that, you know, look, uh, I, I believe it, you 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 do your time, uh, you you do your retribu your your uh, restitution, you do all that stuff. At the end of it, it should be done. You should be able to move on. And the fact that we saddle people with criminal records that can, will never allow them to get employment, and that we preclude in many states them from being able to vote, uh, just seems to me more of the retribution, more of the punitive end of what we've been doing to folks. Yeah, that's exactly right. And there are states across the country that are looking to make sure that those collateral consequences are being reduced. There's actually a bill going through the Pennsylvania legislature right now, the bipartisan bill. It's called Clean Slate. And after a period of, you know, you've done your time or you've you've paid your penance and and whatever you want to say, and you have remained crime free for a number of years, then there is an automatic healing process. And that's what the bill would do. And that's what's going through the through the Pennsylvania legislature. And so it's innovative things like that that are happening. And really, when people are trying to clean up their records, get them, get things um, sealed and expunged, and we're not talking about, you know, rapists and murderers. Crimes. You're not exactly. talking about rapists talk- and murderers. Right. We're talking about low level uh, crimes here of, of being sealed. Then that the uh, the process to get that sealed is really difficult, and so this bill that's going through the legislature is talking about automatic sealing as long as you meet the conditions there. So things like that that are really uh, positive, and hopefully uh, we, those things will come to fruition soon. Yeah, I, I I I've had friends who in the past you know got in trouble when they were 18, 19 years old, and they're in their, in their 40s, 50s, and it's still it's still around their neck. Yeah, absolutely, and we we say we hear rhetoric all the time like why can't they get a job why can't they just you know uh, change the way they are but if you have that criminal record on you and you as an employer you look at that or as somebody who is giving you a loan you look at that uh it's really difficult to then have opportunities later on in life and so this is not about giving people a free pass it's about we as a society how can we what, what do we need for increased public safety in the future, and what can we do to help people, uh, you know, change course in life or have a first opportunity in the first place, so that it, it does increase public safety and that people are, you know, on the path that they need to be on. Yeah, I, I had a. I remember years ago, I was a, a shop steward at the place I worked, and a kid had gotten hurt on the job. She, he was he was 28 years old. Uh, when he was 19 years old, he had committed a felony, and uh, he didn't write it down on his application. So when he got hurt on the job, um, the first thing they did is they did a background check on him, and they found this unreported felony. So the day he got off of workman's comp, they fired him. 
Right, and what's what's going to happen to that, you know, to that kid or to that person now that they don't have a job, and going, you know, going forward, what are the opportunities that are there? So, you know, we've heard, you know, policies like ban the bots, which is a good first step, meaning that you don't ask for um, the uh, the criminal record at the early stages. You may want to look at it later, or you look at policies where people consider a criminal record in context. Right? How many years has it been since then? Is it relevant to the job last application and things like that? If there's more thought put into a particular uh, criminal record or a person's history, then the better it is. And I think that's the entire idea behind smart on crime. We don't want to have policies, whether it's in society or in government, off of gut feeling. We want it to have thought into it. And I think too many times in our country's history and in our government's history, we've done things by gut reaction and just you know, what feels right instead of putting thought behind it. And that's the entire emphasis that we try to make during the Smart on Crime Innovation Conference. Yeah, I, I point to most of the, the Clinton-era rhetoric of, you know, uh, uh, three strikes and you're out, and, you know, we're going to put more cops on the streets, and we're going to b- crack down on crime. And basically all they really did was lock up a lot of poor people for, you know, what, you know, 20 years before weren't, weren't even really enforced crimes. Yeah, and unfortunately, I mean, that's how the sausage is made in a lot of time, in a lot of ways, right? I've had the uh, opportunity to glance behind how Congress works, and uh, sometimes it is really just the reaction to the political news of the day or the yep. social news of the day. And here is a good, easy thing, or I shouldn't say good, but here's an easy thing that we can do to address that, and that's increasing sentences or putting more crimes on uh, on the books. And there is not that uh, real thoughtful, intelligent, strategic, long-term, uh, you know, analysis of what we need before we reactively put policies in place, and that's unfortunate. What do you say to the person that you said, yeah, this is just hippie liberal kind of uh, utopian thinking. They're criminals. They need to be punished, and we need, you know, the, the, the hard hand. This, this kid glove stuff doesn't work. Well, I, I say to them that it's not only a hippie liberal thing. It, it is, you know, we had as a speaker and a a uh, person on, on our steering committee, the general counsel from Coke Industries, and, you know, I don't agree with a lot of things that Coke Industries said on many issues, but on this one, on criminal justice, they are as progressive as, as uh, many people uh, on the left. And so this is not a, a, a partisan issue. It's not even a bipartisan issue. It's a nonpartisan issue. People are understanding that it is not about giving people free passes. That's not it at all. If you want to increase public safety and if you really want to keep your community safe, what are you going to do with just locking people up and then many of them come back after a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years? What's going to happen with those people? They're part of your community again. Whether you like it or not, they're part of your community. So what are we as a society and what are we as a government going to do to increase public safety and also help people in our community. Yeah. And so it's not just, you know, a, a you know, feel good approach. It is real public safety uh, policies that we really, that is being considered. Especially when, when it costs more to send someone to prison than it does to send them to college. And, and I, I would argue part of our for-profit prison system is, is a big driver in all this as well. But it just seems to me very short-sighted uh, to pursue these kind of policies of, you know, making sure that recidivism remains high to keep heads in beds. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's an easy solution. And again, easy is not good. And easy is not, is not always the best. I think it's generally speaking, and you mentioned the for-profit industry, uh, private prison industry, you have people lobbying for more people in beds. And that's how contracts are made. And so when the entire business model of an industry that's supported um, by the Trump administration uh, is advocating for more people in jails for a business motive and for a profit motive, that seems like it is something that is uh, pretty out of whack. Yeah, I mean, it, it just it just seems bizarre to me. So last question I've got for you, because, you know, you in going back to the, uh, the the national anthem protests and and the message that originally was to come was out of that, which is police brutality and the treatment of minorities. Uh, you know, how do we as a society, because I think it starts at that ground level. I think it starts at the relations between, uh, you know, police and the community is how do you rebuild that trust? How do you build that trust? How do we how do we 
Is there a way of making that better going forward? Yeah, so uh, it's a real hard, hard process, as we know. And I, you know, when I was working in the Justice Department, we just, uh, worked with several cities to try to do a somewhat comprehensive effort to push this and to push uh, efforts such as let's train police differently. Let's uh, have police try to look at people differently. And let's put in de-escalation tactics and appropriate violence reduction policies that aren't the same old way. I'll tell you, it is it is a years-long process, and it's a difficult process. But there are some cities uh, that are making some headway. Um, you can look at places in California, in Stockton, California, and others. You can look at places in uh, even in uh, Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh, that are starting to do these types of things, implicit bias training and so forth. Now, I'm not saying those types of trainings is the end-all, be-all. It, in a lot of communities, you need a holistic analysis. You need a holistic change. You need somebody to help push those uh, changes, and you need community involvement. But there is hope. There are police departments, police chiefs, and police officers that are wanting to do it. It's just we've – it's been years in the making, and it doesn't just change over a period of several months or a year. It's going to take years to change the other way as well. There you go. And I appreciate the time, and I appreciate some of your thoughts. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Good talk with you. Ed Chung, Vice President of uh, for Criminal Justice Policy there at the Center for American Progress. You want to check out their stuff, we'll get a link at the ricksmithshow.com. Quick break. Right back. Stick around. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1899. That was the day Union Miners in Mount Olive, Illinois, began commemorating Miners Day. Every year, thousands came into town for a parade, music, and speeches. Mount Olive was the site of the only union-owned cemetery in the United States, established by UMWA Local 728 in the aftermath of the Verdin Massacre. A year before to the day, striking miners had been killed in a shootout with company goons attempting to herd scabs into the mines in Verdin, Illinois. But, as Mother Jones biographer Elliot Gorn notes, the train never unloaded its cargo and the company was forced to settle. The union hoped to erect a gravesite monument commemorating those miners who had been killed at Verdun. But they were refused by those who considered the fallen miners to be murderers and not martyrs. That's when the United Mine Workers established the Union Miners Cemetery. And on this day, 10,000 turned out for the union's memorial ceremony. The United Mine Workers unveiled a monument monument dedicated to the fallen Verdin miners, E.W. Smith, Joe Gitterly, Ernest Kramer, and E.F. Long. The day was filled with parades, music, laying of wreaths, and speeches. Haymarket widow and radical activist Lucy Parsons was among the speakers. In his book, Death and Dying in the Working Class, Michael Rosnow notes that her presence drew a direct connection between the fallen miners and the Haymarket martyrs, cut down while advancing the cause of labor. Thousands traveled to Mount Olive every year for celebrations, including Eugene V. Debs, Miners leader John Mitchell, and Mother Jones. In 1923, Mother Jones asked to be buried with her boys, noting they are responsible for Illinois being the best organized labor state in America. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. From UN headquarters in New York, this is your World in Two Minutes. I'm your host, Lou Vargas, for Talk Media News. Catalonia will not declare independence from Spain, the province's president said Tuesday. That announcement follows a controversial referendum last week in which 90 percent of Catalonians voted for independence, but turnout was low. Since then, Spanish officials have tightened the news, threatening to cancel Catalonia's current semi-autonomy and trying to lure businesses out of the region. In a speech to the Catalonian parliament on Tuesday, President Puigdemont said the risks of pursuing independence were starting to stack up. We've heard that some companies have decided to transfer their company base outside of Catalonia. People are afraid that this may have an impact on our economic situation. Yes. Though he drew rapturous applause by saying Catalonia should be an independent state, Puigdemont said the independence push was being formally put on hold in favor of negotiations. 
but the prospect of talks doesn't look good either. Spanish officials say further concessions are off the table, and top EU leaders appear unmoved by Catalonia's pleas for help. And just days after the inauguration, Donald Trump was invited to the United Kingdom for a state visit. The plan was for Trump to visit this year, but with each passing month, the trip becomes more political and less likely to occur in the near future. First, 1.8 million Brits signed a parliamentary petition asking the government to call off the visit. Then, the Speaker of the House of Commons said Trump was forbidden from addressing the parliament. Now, the Evening Standard newspaper reports the state visit has been scrapped in favor of a much less flashy working visit sometime next year. One highlight also nixed from the plans, an invitation from Queen Elizabeth to visit Buckingham Palace. For more Global News headlines, visit TalkMediaNews.com. Making the blue blood see red. The Rick Smith Show. Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Check out the website, thericksmithshow.com, at, Gle- at Glenn Jesse one uh, Tweeted, interesting that the trucker in P- in the truckers in PA- PR are lazy, but the truckers in Pennsylvania are very fine people who need huge tax cuts for the wealthy. And look, that's, you know, that is the frame. I mean, I, I started off with the show just going, supposedly the audience in the airplane hangar there at the Harrisburg airport uh, were all truck drivers. That's what we're led to believe. And they got the giant truck in the background. And, you know, again, I want to know who, who, who paid for the wrap on the, on the trailer. Uh, you're talking about 20, about, probably about 25 grand to slap that, that wrap on that trailer. But to have a room full of so-called truck drivers who are applauding the end to the estate tax and applauding a top marginal rate of 25% that they're never going to reach. Never. They're never going to make a million dollars a year driving a truck. Sorry. Uh, I did it for uh, for 20. I did it for 20 years. It's never going to happen. Never going to happen. And I keep coming back to this, when will we as working people wake up that every one of these schemes that politicians keep throwing out at us that tell us how wonderful these tax are, tax cuts are going to be, it always, with beyond exception, it always works out to where the well-to-do, more well-to-do, working people, not so much. And the gulf between the haves and the have-nots grows larger and larger. I know what Trump sells. Sounds great. It does. Look, I was watching his his spiel last night, and I was like, wow, you know, if, if any of that were actually true, that would be fantastic. If someone would actually do that, where, look, if you could put 4000 extra dollars into working people's pockets, this economy would boom. That would be a massive stimulus. And the thing is, is, there's even part of me that that gives him some bit of of and I hate saying this, but some bit of credit for for understanding that that would be a great thing. That doing that would would send the economy, you know, smoking right down the road. I just don't know that he knows that what he's doing won't do that. And now you can say too much credit, I'm giving him too much credit, but I actually I actually kind of believe that. I kind of believe he thinks that this is going to put more money in your pocket and mine and take money out of Bob Kraft's pocket. And and even though we know that's not reality, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be very interesting to see how it works out. Uh, again, uh, if you've got any thoughts, questions, comments, Rick at the Rick Smith show dot com. I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts. You missed any of today's program, the Rick Smith show dot com. We're taking tomorrow off medical things doctor appointments, stuff like that back on Monday. We'll see you back here Monday. It's coming from the wind. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show.
Together, we can make America better. Email rick at the ricksmithshow.com or interact with us anytime at the ricksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been the Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.